Elkumwe ote urchche, Ispay ernte ur ye ibobe, ote urspe orinthian ke or teen fe. Now, right there, Miffy especially is saying, <laughs> English speaking people are so strange. You know, they're just, they're so weird. But please don't panic. Don't panic. Um, some of you knew exactly what I was doing there. But in case you didn't catch it, that is called Pig Latin. And basically, I, what I said was, welcome to church. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. And you may or may not know, but Pig Latin's not a real language. Um, pig Latin, actually... Uh, is, is just a common name for a kid's game. It's basically when you're a kid, sometimes you like to have a secret language or a thing that confuses people, but you know what you're saying, but they don't. You know, I, I know we used to do little codes, my sister and I, and we would unlock the code and you knew how to do it. And so you could write a note to your sister and nobody else knew the, the, how to crack the code. So when you think about this, if you've never learned the language, here's how pig Latin works. Okay, I'm going to like, you know, give away the secret. But what you do is you basically take the consonant off the front of any word and you stick it at the end and add a Y to it, the A-Y side. So welcome becomes elcome way. Um, and church becomes urchche. Now, again, it, it just sounds like nonsense when you hear it, but once you know the secret to it, you can actually unlock it. And some of you are saying, okay, as to pay Yatske, what is your oint pay? Um, or, you know, what's your point? Well, this is the point. Here's the point. The simple twist of a tongue can turn a message into a mess, right? I mean, something that makes perfect sense in one context can make absolutely none with just a simple twist. And so, you know, imagine 50 minutes of that. If I were to just sit here and do a, a Bible study in, in Pig Latin, you'd be like, no, thank you. Um, it's bad enough to listen to you in English. Uh, I don't want to listen to you in that. But I remember sitting actually at a funeral that was done in Latin. Uh, it was actually done in Latin for the family. And afterwards, good friend of mine, and he, he had come up with a certain religious upbringing and that, that's what they did. And he said, but you know what? That meant absolutely nothing to me. He said, I have no idea what they said. And he said, my heart is so grieved. My brother is dead. And that's what I get. And I was like, man, I'm sorry, really. I'm kind of sorry that that, that made no sense. I, I he said, I wish you could have done it the service instead because you know at least people would have had some clue what was going on. He said, all these people here with no answers except in Latin. And so, you know, again, when you think about that, something that could be a message can easily become a mess. And that's exactly what was happening in the Corinthian church in the first century. They weren't speaking pig Latin, but they were being pigs. Um, there was confusion. There was chaos among them. And instead of a message that Paul so dearly wanted them to get and to give to their society, they were making a mess of the whole thing. And the root of the problem was their tongue. Now, when I think about that, um, you know, our talk, our speech, our communication can be the best thing, or it can certainly make a mess of things. And so that's what was happening. Their tongues were causing trouble. And so I titled the talk Tongue Twisters. And from the very beginning, what I want you to remember is this. This is the main point of today, whatever else you take away from it, which is it takes only a twist of the tongue, a very small adjustment sometimes to turn a mess into a message or for that matter, a message into a mess. So just to get me at least warmed up, I'm going to put a few of them up here. This one's one that you maybe know. Um, she sells seashells by the seashore. All right. Um, you can try that one if you want. We'll do it together. She sells seashells by the seashore. Okay, that one's good for warming up the tongue. This was one I found. I really like this one. A skunk sat on a stump and thunk the stump stunk, but the stump thunk the skunk stunk. Uh, that one's pretty awesome. Um, you know, we won't try that one together unless something go off the rails. But um, this is a good one. Lesser leather never weathered wetter weather better. Um, so again, if you want to try any of these at home, you can try them there. And the old standby, 
to toy boat, which if you say that five times in a row fast, you will definitely mess it up. <gasps> toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. It, it becomes but toy. Yeah, I don't know what it becomes. But what we do learn from all of those and any of those is that it's easy to trip over your tongue physically, right? It's easy to think that you have something and you think your mind is saying one thing and your tongue is saying something else. But the believers in Corinth were actually tongue twisted spiritually. And the problem was what the Bible says is that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the problem was really a little deeper than that. And so Paul gives him, in a way, a mild tongue lashing in this chapter. And if you've been here the first 13 chapters of the book, you know that 1 Corinthians addresses one tough topic after another. I mean, there's all kinds of equal offense type of stuff. Like you can get offended in the book of Corinth, Corinthians no matter what. And this week has, as I mentioned, two tough topics wrapped into one. It talks about speaking in tongues, which some people say, I don't even know what that is, but you will by the end of this chapter. And then the second one is why women shouldn't talk in church at all. Um, it's just kind of like one of these things that's like, well, first of all, he corrects people uh, of both genders who are talking for any reason. And then he says, you know, you know what? Come to think of it, ladies, just hold your tongue. And of all the things that they could, you could possibly talk about in Christian circles, then or now, I think, Few are more controversial than this. If you want to get in a fight, certainly you could get in a fight over this subject. So speaking in tongues, what is it? Well, first of all, I want to define it as the Bible does, which is a God-given gift to speaking in a language that the speaker doesn't know naturally. Okay, supernatural speech. You see it in the book of Acts. You see it in various points in the New Testament. You see them communicating in some way in a language they didn't go to school for, they didn't learn it, uh, they didn't know it previous to the moment that they were speaking it. Now again, that is a pretty interesting, pretty fascinating thing. The Bible has all kinds of miracles in it, uh, and I love them all. I think they're really awesome. Um, in the beginning, God created is the big one, and if, once I believe that, I can pretty much believe anything else the Bible says. But uh, this is what it talks about. But then it goes on to another topic, which is... Even if it's a language you know, there's certain times to hold your tongue anyway. So who can and who can't speak in certain settings? So right away, again, you might have some questions. Uh, some, most of you have known me or us for a while, but if, if the very first time you came to a service was either about speaking in tongues or they were speaking in tongues, you might find yourself saying, you know what? I have not ended my search for the perfect church. This is not it for me. You know, <laughs> we're going to keep looking. We're going to keep moving. And so, again, to think on this subject, I think, is very important. This is one of the reasons, though, I would love to skip a certain chapter. More than ever, there's reasons not to skip those chapters because so few people even know what the Bible says at all. Um, and so when I think about this, there's a side of the Christian uh, world called cessationist. Okay, that's kind of a big word, but cessationist. I practiced it so I'd be able to say it. Uh, speaking in tongues they believe ended with the apostolic age, okay? Acts is over, so is that. Um, any current experience is fraudulent or demonic. You know, it's either the fake or it's even worse than that. You know, it's, it's of the devil. And as I mentioned last week, cessationists point to last chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, as one of their proof texts. And they say, when the perfect comes, tongues will cease. Tongues of men and angels will cease. And so they interpret the perfect coming as the completed New Testament. New Testament's complete. Apostles are dead. They've said what they need to say. Jesus has said what he needed to say. No more need for whatever this was. We don't need that. And I, I would venture to say that if you read the Bible carefully for yourself, you don't need me to come to the conclusion that the perfect that it's talking about there is not the New Testament, which is never mentioned in that chapter, but the coming of Jesus to end all things at the end. That's the perfect coming. He's the perfect thing coming. And so since we're not at the end of the age, I don't believe we're at the end of the stage where God does miracles. I am not a cessationist, right? But I'm also not a sensationalist. Okay, that's a word that's also could twist the tongue, cessationist, sensationalist, right? But a sensationalist is somebody who 
pretty much that's all they want to think about and talk about is miraculous stuff. You know, come to our miraculous meeting. Come to, at 7 o'clock, the Holy Spirit will be doing these things, you know, and make sure you're there because you don't want to miss the miracle. And so when you think about this, I believe both extremes are extreme. They are not what the Bible teaches. Speaking in tongues, um, some believe, you know, again, the sensationalists believe, and they'll even tell you that it's the only proof that you are really uh, touched by God and filled with the Spirit and all this. So their church service can become a circus, right? And nothing more than a bunch of babbling. Emotionalism and sensationalism and spiritual peer pressure. So I think about those two things, and the Bible teaches neither extreme. And so when you think about this, I think about 1 Corinthians 12, 30. If you'll just jot that one down, it was the beginning of this three-chapter trilogy. I remind you, these things do require a thinking cap. I think that's why people don't want to put it on, right? I mean, most people don't want to think these days. Don't make me think about the Bible or don't use the Bible to make me think. But 1 Corinthians 12, 30, Paul's asking what's called a rhetorical question, meaning we all know the answer. He's like saying, uh, do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And the obvious answer to a rhetorical question is usually right there in front of you. He's saying, no, I, no not all do, and not all interpret those spiritual languages. And so he's making it clear of one, uh, one thing in these three chapters, chapter 12, 13, 14. It's a balance. It's a balance. And you may remember the meat in the middle was love, right? On the two edges, we're talking about spiritual giftings and spiritual abilities and all of this stuff. And so it's very important to know that it, it is not, none of these things are a sign of your spirituality on some level. He talked about that. And so speaking in tongues certainly isn't, but none of these things are. I mean, there, there are people who have amazing spiritual gifts and they're very carnal people this is exactly what was happening they were they were very selfish and very self-centered so don't mistake the fact that someone has some incredible ability that you go wow they must be so godly he said they may not be at all and when you think of that he says i don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts and isn't it funny that this very section section of scripture which i think is super plain and hard to misunderstand that message has been missed and messed like none other. And it brings us to 1 Corinthians 14. And it's a one-stop shop, really, for staying out of extreme tongue trouble and experiencing at the same time everything God has for us as believers. Because I think one of the biggest bummers would be truly to miss your miracle because somebody is so freaked out an area of Christianity that everyone goes, I don't want anything to do with any of that. And you go, wow, but... But God is supernatural. God is super and more than natural. And so when you think about this, if we confine ourselves only to the things that we could possibly understand, well, then we're missing a lot of what God wants to do. So look what he says in verse 1. It's a bridge from last chapter that talks so much about love. It says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Verse 2, for he who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to men, but to God. No one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. There's a couple of things in these first three verses that are really worth highlighting. And one of the things I appreciated, uh, one of the great influences in my life, was a guy who was at least bilingual, uh, very good in English, very good in Spanish. And I used to attend the Spanish service that he would teach. And one of the things he did is he spoke very deliberately and very slowly, even in Spanish. And I would find myself saying, I understand this. Now, it might help that I'd already been to two English services on the same topic right before it. That helped a lot. But just the way he was so clear was really helpful. He wasn't like speaking uh, 100 miles an hour like sometimes people can. And so this is what he's saying. He, I, I'm kind of even thinking of him at this moment. He was such a deliberate guy in, in even his pronunciations. He'd be edification, 
exhortation, you know, comfort to men. Not a, not a real hyper guy, but very, very clear. And when I think about this, one of the thoughts here is this. It talks about this. Speaking in tongues is communicating with God. Did you see that there? It said, who, he who speaks in a tongue, verse 2, does not speak to men, but to God. Now, what language does God speak? All of them. I mean, let's, let's be clear on that, right? All of them and maybe even some I don't know and nobody knows, right? God reserves the right to have a language you don't know. He reserves a right to have a language nobody knows unless he gives it to them. And so I think about this. This is a, a thought that is well within my understanding. A language unknown to the speaker and to the listeners. And then verse 3, it says, Prophecy, on the other hand, is communicating with people in the language everybody understands. Isn't this interesting? Because sometimes prophecy gets like this weirdness to it, but biblically it's not. It's not foretelling the future. That's, although it can have an element of that. It's not that. It's forthtelling the truth in a clear way. Because he said right there, people understand it for edification, that means building up. Exhortation, that means motivating. And comfort, meaning, oh, wow, the, that, I feel a lot better after hearing that. See, I think about this prophecy. You know, sometimes you, you have this idea of the wild-eyed prophet who's all scary and weirded out and everything. And you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not what it talks about really there. I mean, that guy's very uncomforting to me. But Paul contrasts prophecy with speaking in tongues. And this is what he th said. Prophecy is preferable in the church. At least in the church, it's preferable. Why? For the very simple matter that it means something to the listener, right? He says prophecy benefits others. Speaking in tongues benefits at most the speaker and God, I suppose. And so when you think about this, this is the first major point, right? Speaking in tongues, it's speaking to God. But prophecy is speaking with people. And which one's preferable? He just said. The impressive one is saying something clear and understandable to the person next to you more than all of the spiritual mumbo jumbo, if you will let me call it that, that you might say between you and God. Isn't that interesting? I, I find people to have the inverse as a perspective generally oh well i you know i'm not that spiritual all i did is kind of you know tell them i'm there for you if you ever need me oh wow well, that, that was prophecy right i mean that was god's truth or you know I, god's truth can be very i just read a verse i really didn't know what to say so i just gave you a verse i don't know if if and they're like wow that verse really meant a lot to me Okay, well then you have done the preferable thing. See, and when I think about it, our tongue is meant to bless. If you ever wonder, what am I supposed to use this thing for? Um, it's meant to bless. This is what he says in verse 4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. In other words, you build yourself up. But he who prophesies edifies the church. That's others. I wish you all spoke in tongues, he says. I'm not saying anything bad about it. I'm just saying even more, I wish that you all forth told the truth of God for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification now when I think about this again speaking in tongues is not this alone but let's say uh, that we were to do to Miffy what I love to do to people and hate to have happen to me which is I if you know a different language people will say like do, do something in your native language, you know? And, and people are like, no, I don't want to do that. And, and, but they might do it. And then they'll go, they'll say something and they go, oh, that's so cool. What did you say? And you might have said, I don't like you. And you go, oh, but it sounded so nice, you know? That, that shirt looks stupid or whatever. And you're like, oh, it's so romantic what you said. No, it wasn't, you know, because I have no idea what's going on. But this is what he's saying. Somebody who says something, if they say it in a language you don't know, if if they tell you what they said, then that's still prophecy because he's saying it's, it's not preferable to say that. It might be actually a beautiful thing to hear something in another language and have someone say, what did you say? Well, that was, that was Psalm 23 in, in French. And you're like, wow, that's so cool. You mean 
French people know Psalm 23 too? And you're like, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> duh, you know, things like that. And you go, oh, man, how cool. Edif edify, this is a, a Spanish word, edificio. I'm not speaking in tongues, I'm just, I, I, I know that vocabulary. Edificio, it means to build up. An edifice, it means a Latin-based language. It means to build something up, to strengthen it, to bless. That's what he's saying, your tongue should build. Okay, if you want to know what you, your tongue can tear down or it can build, right? What should it do? Before I say anything, ask, is this edificio, right? Does it build up or does it destroy? He says, that's good. Uh, uh, so speaking in tongues could be a blessing. If, uh, I don't even know what I'm saying. I remember <laughs> this happening to me as a kid. Um, somebody taught me Spanish curse words before I knew any other words. And I, I didn't know what they were. And they're like, go say that to that guy over there. And I'm like, okay. Um, and I did. And he was like, uh, no. And, and, and so I think about this. This is what he's saying. You don't know what you're saying when you're speaking in tongues. So you better speak to God. Or you better know what you're saying. God, God's not going to be offended. you know. But he says, blesses others with prophecy. I think about this. Primarily personal. This is what you know. Again. Uh, that speaking in tongues, whatever it is, biblically, it's speaking to God, primarily. It's between you and God. It's not between you and others. And it's not surprising that the selfish church, you know, there in Corinth, if, they, if God gave them a supernatural gift, they show off with it. Rather than doing something to bless somebody else and asking, I wonder how this feels to the person who's next to me. I wonder how this is affecting the people around me. They used it to build themselves up and to build themselves up in other people's eyes. Whoa, that guy's like super spiritual. He's, what is that he's doing? Well, he's, he's, he's got the anointing of God. The Holy Spirit is upon him right now. He's using his prayer language. Wow, wow, I don't have one of those. That's pretty cool. That's wild. So this is what he's saying. If no English uh, or no interpretation is giving, given in that context, that person is not even doing what God wants him to do. Um, I'll, I'll never forget this one. You know, that one day we were channel surfing, right? Which is a dangerous thing to do, especially if you come across one of the religious channels. But um, we were there on a religious channel and the, the kids were in the room, young, you know, at the time. And, and there was this guy who was just like wild-eyed into the camera and pointing and he was alternating between English and some other supposed language that was you know speaking in tongues right that's what the, was happening in the service and no interpretation was given but i do know this the english portions weren't speaking to god uh it was belting out judgment there wasn't a lot of um you know edification or really you know comfort or any of the rest of that and the kids were totally freaked out they're like it looked like they're like what is that? And I'm like, well, I know what it wasn't. <laughs> I can tell you what it is. It's a tongue twister, is right? That, that's somebody twisting something that might be or might not be a spiritual gift. But I know no matter what, it's not being delivered in a spiritual context. So I said, this is 1 Corinthians 14 being lived out right in front of your eyes. So our tongues were meant to bless. If a person has a true gift of tongues, they can be a blessing to themselves and to God with that. They could have a prayer language that their mind doesn't fully understand. See, I think about this. Paul says in verse five, I wish you all spoke in tongues. Uh, he's basically saying, this would be really awesome if everyone did this. Why? Because he's saying, that who doesn't need to be built up in their prayer relationship with God, right? I mean, who, who doesn't need a little bit of better communication with God? Who doesn't need to hear him better and have a sense that you've been heard better? I mean, I, I don't know anyone who, who would say, no, that sounds bad. Um, so what he's saying is, I'm not against it. And in fact, desire it. And I, to the best of my knowledge, this is not something I have ever received. Not opposed to the idea, but it's I think it's actually kind of unlikely that it'll ever happen with me. Why? Because part of it is someone has to be pretty open to things. And I'm kind of an analytical person. So even if I did it, I would say that probably wasn't it. Just by my nature. That's, that's kind of how I am. I'm like, eh, that was probably nonsense, right? I mean, that, if I prayed in, in something I didn't understand, I'd just say, 
eh, the, whatever. I don't know. I'm just not that experimental or experiential kind of in my life. Now, I have other gifts, I think. So I look at those things, I go, I do know that, that I, if there is a prophetic gift that is to foretell the truths of God in clear, uh, comforting, exhorting, explanatory, building up kind of ways, I think I have that. So who, who needs every gift? I don't know. The Bible says not everyone has gifts. So I'm okay to have it. I'm okay not to have it. But this is what I think about, you know, a love language that you communicate with God. If someone says, I, I, I want that above all other things, he says, well, then ask God for it, desire it, chase after it, nothing wrong with that. Your tongue was meant to bless, but he says it's hard to, to bless people in something they don't understand. And so when you're in the public setting, that's different than the private setting. I think that's an amazing thought, an amazing thought. Verse 6, he says, But now, brethren, now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying or teaching? Even things without life, whether harp or flute, when they make a sound, unless there's a distinction in the sound, how will it be known what's piped or played? Verse 8. But if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself for battle? And so this is the second point. I already made it, but I'll say it again. Our tongues can make a mess. So our tongues were meant to bless, but our tongues can make a mess. I mean, we know that, right? And this is what he's saying. An unclear call. A confusing thing. The Corinthian Christians were tongue-twisted. They were given maybe a legitimate gift. Some of them were given the gift, and I bet others faked it you know how i know this even to this day i know this is true there are people who have genuine abilities and there's people who try to copy those genuine abilities for their own purposes there's people who have like this tremendous capacity to do something and maybe even the humility to go with it and then there's someone else like in the book of acts there were miraculous things going on and a guy looked on who was a magician and said that would up my act I need that. Uh, give me that. Tell, tell me your magician's trick. And they said, it's not a magician's trick. It's God's work. And he went, yeah, 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 yeah whatever. How much, how much does it cost? And you see him trying to counterfeit what was a true thing. And I watched a fascinating 2020 uh, show on the speaking in tongues, um, not, maybe five years ago. It was really fascinating. A reporter, an investigative reporter, went into charismatic churches and said, I'm going to have an open mind. I'm not here to debunk this, but I'm also open to finding out what is this. And you know what they walked away with this conclusion? A small percentage of people here have, they have this linguistic programmer thing, this computer that can tell, like if I make up a fake language right now, it's going to have no structure to it and it's going to be dorky. You know, like if I do it, I'm going to go like, uh, um, day, blah, 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 the, um, record uh, fan stuff. And you'd be like, what was that? that? That was just you trying to be making up your own language. If I asked you and put the pressure on, make up your own language, tell me something in a sentence, you go, uh, uh, and you, you'd either retreat to some language you already knew, or you would actually have some unstructured garbage. But they did this linguistic tester on it. And about 80% of the people who claimed to be speaking in tongues fell into the nonsense category. And about 20% of them, they said, this is a structured language. The computer's turning back, don't recognize it, but it does have a structure and a plan to it. There's something about it, there's something to it. And that's what the reporter went away saying, yes, it's fake and yes, it's real and a much smaller percentage of real than fake. And I went, well, that pretty much aligns with everything I know about the Bible and everything I know about life. See, this is what he says, the random notes on a musical instrument, nobody wants to listen to that. Free form jazz is not random. It's random, it's improvised, but it's not random, right? 
So when you think about that, you want to know what random is? Back in high school, I was a band geek. Uh, I was in the marching band, the orchestra band in the off season. We would do that. And my best friend at the time played the trombone and I played the drums. Now on our best days, we weren't that good because we didn't take it that seriously, right? Even at our chosen instrument, we were kind of meh. But when we had a substitute teacher and it did happen occasionally, we would switch instruments. We would just, he'd hand me the trombone, I'd hand him the drumsticks, and we made uncertain sounds. Oh, man, did we have a great day. We were so blessed on that day. Now, the teacher was very stressed. We edified ourselves, just like this. Is, what? <laughs> He's like over there, you know, playing roles that aren't roles, and I'm like, whoa, 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 and yelling into the trombone and stuff to make weird notes. Random notes. They were fun to play, but they were not fun to hear. And again, improvisational jazz, there's a certain unstructured wildness to it. The musicians don't even know where they're headed till they're headed there. But somehow they do it. Why? Because they have a gift. There's a difference, right? You understand that. A clear call for an army, a uh, military background knows there's a bugle blast that says retreat and there's one that says charge. And if you give one that's sort of half of each, the army, half the army is going to be running to the mess hall and half of the army is going to be running to wonder where everyone went. And this is what he's saying. Why, why is there so much confusion in the world? Because there's so little balance in understanding in believers. I've noticed it. I've seen it. People are either dried up and don't believe in the supernatural today or they're so sensationalized by all of it that they don't understand how to have a natural conversation with a normal person. And you're like, huh, what if there was somebody who knew when to do what? <laughs> See, you look at verse 9, he says, So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongues words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. See, Paul's goal, think about this. This is so instructional. This is why I love these things, because if you take away these things, they're so important. Paul's goal was to be easy to understand, to bring a message, not a mess. And isn't it interesting that sometimes Bible teachers especially feel a pressure to be profound? I was listening to students just the other day where one of my came out of a Bible class and I said, what'd you learn? They said, I have absolutely no idea. Zero. They said, the... Uh, just, you know, fortunately it wasn't mine. I'm not trying to throw a guy under the bus, but I'm like, well, what did you talk about? And it was like a very obscure and, and somewhat important uh, to somebody um, passage out of, you know, uh, Exodus that was on this and that and the other. And the kids were like, I'm just trying to figure out what the meaning of life is. And this is our, our why tomorrow is worth living. This is really difficult for me to connect this to that. And again, sometimes people do have that pressure to be profound. Like, oh, well, I'm the scholar. What does this mean, pastor? Well, it means what it says. Oh, you mean I can read it for myself and understand it? Yeah, you actually kind of can. And I would love to help you, if I can, to do that, to believe that the Bible can be believed and understood. And to create this great gulf of the anointed and the non-anointed is really, it's, there's a pressure on people to do that. They like to do it because, oh, well, pastor, you pray. You've got the special red phone. No, I don't. I do not have the special red phone. And in fact, there are people that I know in this room who are far, far more effective prayers than I am. So I am not a pro prayer, <laughs> whatever that is. I can barely say it. So again, that anointing, oh man, does it feel good when, when somebody out there thinks you're super spiritual? Oh, it does. Oh, pastor, you pray for my healing because I know God listens to you. Well, I don't know if he listens to me, but my shoulder still hurts. Um, you know, but if, I, if I'm like, yes, you know, I've got the power. It feels so good to do that. But sometimes the profound things are the most simple. In verse 10, he says, There are, it may be, many kinds of language in the world. None of them is without significance. Therefore, if I don't know the meaning of the language, I'll be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Now, I, lo I love this because common language builds a bridge, right? But lack of, of language builds a barrier. Have you thought back ever to the Tower of Babel back in the Old Testament? You know that story where there was the confusion of languages? It basically says right prior to that, if they all spoke the same language, nothing would be impossible for them. 
So let's just mix it up and we'll keep them a little bit humble. Because there are a few things more humbling than how dumb I am in other languages. Man, I am pretty dumb in English. But I'm really dumb in French. I mean, I don't even know where the bathroom is. In fact, I might very well ask for a shoe with cheese on it and please kick me in the head. Uh, you know, and you're like, no, I was actually asking where the bathroom is. I, I'm sorry, that, whoops. You know, um, there's a very thin line between ham and soap in, in French, okay? It's jamon, jabon, all right? You might get an omelet with soap. If, if you're not careful, it's very humbling to have to realize how dumb you are in another language. And so you think about this building a bridge is that thing of saying, no, you know, oh, oh I, I'll help you across that. When I was in college, I lived in, a, in London for a year and I traveled Europe by train and it was among the most amazing days of my life. And I've done a lot of travel in my life. But this was unique because I was totally alone and I was, I traveled by myself because my traveling companion, my roommate, my friend actually got sick and had to go home. And so I went on by myself. He's like, go on without me. You know, the famous phrase and all that stuff that I did, you know, no, don't worry about me. I said, I won't. Um, and he went back to London and no, he was fine. Um, we're friends to this day. And so, uh, I was by myself and days would go by where I would not speak a word to anyone. I would go all day seeing amazing things, seeing the most amazing moments of my life and no one to say anything to anything about it. I didn't even know what to say and I was so weirded out by that. I would sit in trains surrounded by going from one country to another and one region to another and one dialect to another and I, I just never would hear English. I was in, in places where I, I made it my point to go away from w in places that were familiar to me. But I was like, this is so weird. I'm like the only guy on the planet who thinks my thoughts and all this. And I began to feel very isolated. And, and at one point, I, one of the really funny ones, I was in Italy and I was walking along in this neighborhood and my kids have heard these stories, but, but you know, the, this woman came out of a, a house and she was like waving her arms wildly at me. And she actually had like a rolling pin in her hand. I mean, she had like been, I don't know, rolling up pasta or whatever. And she was like, you know, yelling, yelling, yelling down the alley at me. And she's waving her arms wildly. And she was, looked so mad. And I, I looked around. I was like, it's me in this alleyway, right? And I, I started stammering. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, hi. Don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know anything. I apologize. Uh, bye. Bye. You know, or whatever. And she just was yelling louder and more sternly and everything. And I was just about to turn and run from this woman. And a little dog ran past me up into her house. She'd been yelling at her dog. She was yelling at her dog to come inside. And because I had no idea what was going on, I almost like got, uh, you know, got freaked out and into a fight with a, a lady with a rolling pin. And I, I walked away. This is what I thought. I'm dumb, but I also thought, boy, the dogs are smart here. They, they know Italian and I don't, you know? What amazing dogs they have in this country. And I went to Moscow later uh, in, that, in that same time frame, and I went for a week. And because I didn't have time to really learn Russian, what I did is I learned to practice the alphabet. And this time it was with my friend Louis. You know, he was well by this point. And we, so we, we learned it together. But we learned how to pronounce Russian words. But this was the amazing part again, phonetically. We had no idea what we were saying. So wherever we'd go, we'd say the word, right? Whatever we saw, we'd say the word and we got our pronunciation down. Now, the way they did it back then was right after Glasnost. So they had just opened up the country some, right? But we still had to have a guide. Now, here's the great part about it. They assigned a beautiful Russian guide to our group. And I didn't know Lynn yet, so don't judge me. But here is, here is, Lewis and I on the other side of the world with this beautiful Russian guide and we're like, we need to impress her with our language skills. She's like 25 and we're like 20, right? So, so we practice this, this phrase, this big long phrase that we found on a piece of paper in the room. And we went up to her and the next day we told her in English, hey, we know some Russian, we learned some Russian. She says, oh, and, and we said, yeah, we, we don't know what this means, but we're gonna say it. So we, on the count of three, we pronounced the word and she starts laughing and what we had said was sanitized 
for your protection. Um, it had come off the toilet. Um, so, so I used to know how to say that in Russian, don't know anymore. But Paul's point in, in this verse, this set of verses, is you can make a mess of a message so easy if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know what you're saying. And God can and does, I believe, gift some believers with the ability to pray and communicate and praise him in a language that they never learned a natural way. And I go, that's pretty cool. And God knows what I'm saying even if I don't. And that's pretty cool, which means I can use any language or no language to speak to God. There's even a place in the Bible where it says, we don't know what to say, so we just groan. There's time where you're like, Ah, amen. Um, you know, just in Jesus' name, ah, you know, <laughs> or whatever. And he's like, I know what you mean. And so using language to build a bridge, not a barrier, that's what God wants to do. And he wants us to cross that bridge. But he wants us to cross that bridge with other people, too. He doesn't want us to build that barrier. So, you know, it's true in the natural. It's true in the supernatural. And God understands when a person speaks in a in a unknown language, but people don't. So it's just plain rude to do that to people. If I know two languages and you know one, and I insist on speaking in the one you don't understand, that's rude, isn't it? We think it's rude. God thinks it's rude too. So this is what he says in verse 12. Even so you, if you're zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of church, uh, the church that you seek to excel. Man, I wanna excel in things that make other people do better, feel better, be better. <laughs> See, it's interesting that some churches promote speaking in tongues as proof of real spirituality, and yet Paul right here said it's, it actually is pretty dangerous in terms of real spirituality. Real spirituality is about what is good for others. And so the reason God might give a gift to somebody who doesn't deserve it is because nobody deserves it. See, I, I try to remember that. Sometimes you go, well, well, why, well, then why would he give a gift to somebody if they're going to misuse it? Because... They're grace gifts. Grace is given non to the deserving. It's given because God is gracious. And sometimes somebody learns over time, too. There might be something that they did in their immaturity that now they're embarrassed later about. But God gives the gift for you to grow into it. The same way you hand your car keys to a kid who you know doesn't know how to drive very well. But you know what? They're going to learn to drive by driving, right? That's how you learn to drive, by driving. And you learn to drive by crashing. And you learn to drive by all of these things. And so this is what he says. Verse 12, if you're zealous for spiritual gifts, focus first on the ones that bless others. I was thinking about this, you know, back to different experiences I've had, real life experiences. I don't know what weird experiences you've had. Maybe we just attract weird, but, um, you know, weird attracts weird. But I remember a time, I'm pretty sure this one was with Bethany. I'm almost sure. But we were at a grocery store and I was at the checkout line and a person bagging my stuff, the person, the person at the checkout said to me, speak in tongues. And I'm like, I was expecting paper or plastic, right? I mean, I'm like, huh? Uh, speaking, no, they, and, and seriously, there's no one else like kind of around us. And they said, are you a spirit-filled believer? Do you speak in tongues? And I'm like, well, yes, on the first part, no on the second. Um, and they went, they, I did. I said, no, I, it's not, not a gift I have. And they said, well, then you're not saved. They seriously said this to me at the store. And I'm like, well, uh, thank you. Um, see you next week. You know, I, it, it was just like, again, what, it, what I wanted to do was stick my tongue out at them. What I wanted to do was give them a prophecy. What I wanted to do, was, but I didn't. You know, because sometimes it takes more Holy Spirit to not say something than to say something, right? And this is one of the messages of this passage. In the Christian circles, there's peer pressure. I've seen it. People reduced to ridiculous messages, you know, message, measures to try to do this. You know, because it is, especially uh, youth camps can be really crazy for this. But, okay, we're going to have the time when everyone's going to speak in tongues and, and, and somebody will, like, go, okay, see my new bow tie, see my new bow tie, see my new bow tie, see my new bow tie. My mama bought a Honda, my mama bought a Honda, my mama bought a Honda. And you're like, okay, that, you're doing you know, yes, and you're like, no, that's just my mama bought a Honda really fast, or seashells, seashells by the seashore, um, leather, weather, weather, better weather, leather, you know, and you're like, no. Gifts of the Spirit don't need hype, they don't, they don't need pressure, they don't need human intervention like that. 
And anything that divides people into spiritual elite haves and haves not is not being operated in God's way. That's a very simple way to know it. So if it doesn't bless, it makes a mess. You know where it's, you know what it's about. Verse 13, let's move on. He says, therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may in, might interpret. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, my understanding is unfruitful. What's the conclusion then? He says, I will pray with my spirit. I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the spirit. I'll also sing with understanding. I've, I've been in a place where I've been singing along to a song that I have no idea what it was because I was in a church service so I figured I was pretty safe and the lyrics are up there and I'm like I don't know what this is but I can sing along to the tune and everything else and this is Paul basically saying go along to get along man just use both if you're in a place where this is happening like all right cool if if you're in a place where it isn't happening all right cool he says there's two different ways to pray, and he says, I just balance them out. And the second way he prays with understanding, he says, that's a good one. That'll be a balanced believer. There'll be times when you'll run out of words, and you may keep going, and that's okay, too. And he says, as long as you're not making people run away, <laughs> yeah, that's good. And so he says, verse 16, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies, occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at the giving of thanks? since he doesn't really know what you said. If you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Remember, Paul's saying it several times, several ways, so we make sure we don't miss it. How we still miss it, I don't know. But he's, you might say, move on, Paul, we get it. But people don't get it, so he doesn't move on. Amen, he says, that's a so be it. I agree. How could I say amen to a prayer I don't agree? Okay, I'm going to pray in tongues. And I go, um, so be it. You go, maybe that was, may Scott be stricken with a curse. And you go, well, then no, I don't agree with that. It's like signing a contract that I, do, I can't read. It's not in a language I understand. I, I'm not saying amen to that. But I'll say amen to things that I understand. Well, amen. Let's pray together. Why would I ever pray in something that somebody doesn't understand? He says, I thank my God that I speak tongues in tongues more than all of you little brag from Paul there but verse 19 he says yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue brethren don't be children in understanding in malice be babes in other words be kind of innocent but in understanding you you can't be innocent in understanding you should have a mature understanding verse 18 again Paul's putting some very strict guidelines around the public use of of this gift and someone might there i don't think it was a brag i think what he's saying there is look i i, I want to make sure nobody thinks oh pal's just got sour grapes he's just putting it down because he hasn't exercised he's like you know what i wish everyone did it as much as i get to do it but i don't notice i haven't done it in public and they're like well why don't you do it then and he's like i have a very obvious reason why i don't i'd rather do something that matters in public. In the law, it's written, verse 21, with men of other tongues and other lips, I'll speak to this people, and yet for all of this, they still won't hear me, says the Lord. So God goes through all available means, but people still don't get it. Verse 22, therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, it's for those who believe. This little tongue twister, thought twister, I'm gonna take just a moment, I think it's worth a moment of our time to figure out what he's saying here, because he says, Tongues are for a sign to unbelievers. What does that mean? Well, I can tell you one thing that it means. Um, it means that in the book of Acts, there was a time when there were unbelievers and they gathered round because they're like, wow, I hear this in my language. That's weird. I thought I was the only guy in Jerusalem speaking my, you speak my language? And they're, and they're, but they're praising God. They're not, they're not really talking to that guy. They're just, man, that's so cool that Paul the Apostle is, is from my hometown. And the guy next to him is hearing in a different language that same thing. And he's like, they're, they're all like drawn to this thing. That was a crazy miracle. You got to say, that was a big time miracle. That says the apostles who were unlearned ordinary men, right? These are fishermen. Where did they learn this elite dialect from down the road in another country? Well, they didn't. 
God gave it to them. Why? Because that was what was going to get them the message that they would understand. See, what was interesting in it, it was quite an attractant, right? It makes some sense. But he says, but if I'm hanging around with believers, what? Why, do I need, why would I ever need to do that? See, the language that they hadn't learned was it was kind of like the pyrotechnics that God used to draw people over to it. And that, but they understood it. That was part of the miracle there, too. It wasn't just gibberish to them. They understood the praises of God being spoken. And then they had an other language in common, Aramaic. And that is the one that he gave the sermon in. Right? Peter preached in a single language, not in tongues. He preached in a single language, and they all went, we have seen amazing things today. Now, some people said, whatever drugs they're on, I'd like to try them. So some people didn't even get it, and that's what he's saying. So he said, they're not drunk. It's the middle of the morning. This is the work of God. God has done something to attract people. And you know what? God is not above using miracles for people to hear the message. Did he not do that in the Bible all throughout, but he didn't always do that. Sometimes he just gave the message and the miracle was people understood it without the miracle. And the weird part is Jesus oftentimes said, I'm not doing a miracle because that's all you care about. And I, here's, I'm going to speak so plainly that that will really tell where your heart is. Isn't that interesting? So God does different things in different places. Acts chapter 2 is a good cross-reference. But he says, they'll think you're crazy if they come into every meeting every week and you guys are weird. If you're weird, that will not touch the world. Isn't that a cool thought that he's kind of like, unbelievers will think you've lost your mind. So uh, there's this glorious balance in verse 22. Prophesying is for those, it's not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. What's he saying? That gift should be given to believers so that you can turn unbelievers into believers. Think about this, verse 23. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, they come in who are uninformed. Won't they say, you're crazy, you're out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever, or an uninformed person comes in, he's convinced by all, he's convicted by all, that the secrets of their heart would be revealed and falling down on their face, they'll worship God and report that God is truly among you. I can't tell you how many people I know who were unbelievers, who walked into places where there were believers having a normal, balanced, Bible-believing worship time with simple songs that could be understood, simple messages that hit the heart, and that person walked in thinking people were crazy to be Christian and walked out thinking they'd be crazy not to be one. And that's what Paul's talking about. He's saying if, if, you had a, if you had a proper use of bridge building communication, that overflow of the heart, you'd be amazed how much of an impact you might have on someone. You know, imagine somebody coming in for the first time today, if they did, and we were just all talking in some unknown language all at once. They might just sneak right back out the door. But again, what if maybe they happen to come in at that God-appointed moment, and this has happened so many times in my life, where just right when someone walked in, there was something going on, and they were like, uh, wow, that was weird. I almost didn't come today, and then I came, and then you, it was like you were at my house when I was talking with my wife before I got here, and you're like, yeah, I wasn't, but God was. And it's amazing how God can do that in a person's life. See, they would think that we were insane, again, if we don't have self-control. See, and I think about this, verse 26, he's getting down to the end, but he says, how is it, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, you have a teaching, you have a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. He says, let all things be done for edification. Again, our tongue was meant to bless. He says, but if anyone speaks in a tongue, okay, if you must do this, he says, at least don't dominate the time with it. And if somebody does it and they want to pray to God, out loud, in public, in that language nobody understands, at least let them at the end of it say, by the way, what I was saying there was such and such and such and such. I've been in some prayer meetings where that happened just like that, and everyone was edified. And I was like, that is so cool. That is just so cool. Nobody felt bad. Nobody felt inadequate. Everyone said, God is just so good. And then he says, 
But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church. Lodge that little phrase in your brain right there. Let him keep silent. Let him keep silent in the church. Let him speak to himself and not to God. This is a person under control. Verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first one keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn, all may be encouraged. The spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophets. He's saying nothing's going to happen to you that you can't control. It's not just going to burst out of you like a snake or whatever. And the, and the question, you know, comes to this, you know, well, if I haven't done this and I did do this, what would it be like? Well, I don't know. I already told you I haven't done it. But I know people who say they haven't. I take them at face value because I take their faith at face value. They're very gentle and, and uh, you know, almost had to pry out of them what it was, you know. But the, were you just like taken over? And they're like, no. Because it says right here, if you don't want to do it, you won't do it. Because God's a gentleman. He's not going to like force you to do something you don't want to do. God's not going to move your mouth like the weird movies, you know, where they're like their mouth is moving and the dialogue's coming off at a different time or something like that. It's not going to be like that. What it, what it is to those who say that they've done it, and I believe them, it's just they said it's like, it's just a really peaceful moment where they felt like I didn't know what to say and I didn't really think too hard about what to say, but I was saying something and I felt heard and I felt like God heard me and I was just edified. You're like, well, there you go. Pretty simple. Any and all spiritual gifts remain subject to the control of the person exercising them. And why does that matter? Because that means if you have the gift of mercy, you don't have to have it. You don't have to have mercy. But you can choose to exercise it, and God in that choice will enable the choice. Is it going to be a, I think, I think I'm getting a prophecy? And you're like, why are you doing that? I, I, blah, you know, and you're like, why? Why is it like, it's not like that biblically, right? I'm not going to go to order food at the restaurant and but oh no, sorry, I spoke in tongues. I didn't, you know, I didn't want that to happen. It's not going to happen. See, and people make this excuse all the time for behavior. Oh, well, you know, I was acting under the Holy Spirit. He says, if you're acting under the Holy Spirit, you'll be under the control of the Holy Spirit, which would be a self-control, wouldn't it? See, think about this. If you can't help it, <laughs> then it's the human spirit masquerading as the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 33, is God, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Whenever I look at confusion, I say, well, that's not God. Whenever I look at peace, I go, well, that must be God, because peace doesn't happen very naturally. As in all the churches of the saint, uh-oh, here we come, verse 34, let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. They are to be submissive, as the law also says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husband at home, for it's shameful for women to speak in church. Well, ladies, we're all out of time. Um, no time for that. Phil, you want to go on down to the summit and discuss this? Um, if you want to know what this means, ask Lynn. I think this is why she was mad at me in my dream last night. I'm pretty sure it had something to do with this. But what is Paul saying? What is Paul not saying? Well, I know what he's not saying. He's not saying that women don't have something to say in church or that they don't have anything of value because 1 Corinthians 11, he already said, ladies, if you're prophesying and praying in the church, wear the appropriate head covering that was culturally understood at the time. So let me tell you a few things that you can use as cultural context and then you decide what he was saying. In the culture, men and women sat in opposite rooms before Christianity. They didn't even go into the same place. There's places like this still in the world where women are simply not allowed into the room at all. When you look at the Jewish temple, the women had a court of the women. There was first the court of the Gentiles where men and women Gentiles were not allowed in. And then the women got one step closer. Okay, you're a Jewish, but you're still a woman. So we'll put you out in the courtyard, and then the men go into the temple. That's how it was. Jesus came, blew past all of those barriers, built all kinds of bridges, said, these 
had a reason for a season. One of them was to teach you how much you need to learn. And one of the things you need to learn is God made ladies and men, and he loves them both. And he says, guess what? There's neither Jew nor Gentile. Ooh, court of the Gentiles, bye-bye. Uh, men and women, they come into the throne of grace equally. But guess what? Culture's a little slow to catch up with some things. And so this was a massive deal in Corinth. The men and the women were in the same room in a church service, same room. They would still sit on opposite sides. So there's a person teaching, explaining scriptures. Again, the women used to not be worthy of education, right? We wouldn't educate a woman. Why would you do that? Again, there's cultures to this day. Right now, you could go transport yourself right there, and they still don't believe it. I just saw the other day that a certain culture has finally allowed women to drive. So again, sometimes we think here in the, oh, the United States, we're so... Huh. Where Jesus is gone, women have been elevated. Don't ever blame Jesus for how women are treated. And so you look at this. Um, what he's saying is, you know what? Don't just yell out. Don't just, hey, I don't understand that. He says, ask your, ask your husband when you get home. This is an incredible barrier being broken. Don't break this. Don't make a mess of the message we're trying to bring. We're trying to bring a message of harmony and boy, you can sure mess it up pretty easily. Those things are very, very uh, fragile. I want you to quickly refer back to the prior subject, right? Verse 28, that's why it's worth looking at. He, he just said, a guy who can speak in tongues, let him stay silent. He's saying there's a time where a guy needs to shut his mouth in the church, <laughs> right? So what is he saying? It, every person, now he's switching it over to this situation and he says, you know what, ladies, you're half of the room should be all ears. Open your ears. Open your minds. Open your Bibles. But please, if you could, keep your mouths closed for now. What's he saying? Because it's going to create chaos. There were some guys very uncomfortable with the fact that there was a woman in the room at all. Much less one, well, I've got something to say about that, and I think the rabbi's wrong. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That just wasn't going to fly. That was going to undo everything that Jesus had worked so hard to do. And when you think about where we are today compared to this, oh man, we're so far. And, and yet it's based in the same root of understanding, which is submission. Our mission is submission. My mission is submission as a husband, as a pastor, as a person, as a leader. If I am too big to serve, I am too small to lead, right? This is what he's saying. It, it takes more Holy Spirit to hold your tongue than to speak in tongues or to speak your mind. When you think about this, submission to authority is one of the greatest signs of being filled with the Spirit, whether you're a man or a woman, an adult or a child. If someone has a problem with that overall message, I will never apologize for that. I will always give cultural context so that somebody doesn't blame Paul as this horrible woman-hating guy, and you're like, Paul? <laughs> Paul got flogged because of his radical statements on Gentiles and Jews, men and women, slaves and free. Don't be too quick to bug Paul over this one or Jesus or the Bible. Very revolutionary book. The church in Corinth was doing something so radical. Remember in the pagan context? Oh, the unbelievers, they're so much more free. You know what the Corinthian women were? Prostitutes. That was their role in the religious ceremony. So here's Paul saying, you know what? They're worth educating. And they've got a, some catching up to do. And he says, catch up here, catch up at home. That's amazing. And when you think about that, I, I think about our daughter Bethany. It's not because she's a lady or because she's a nurse. But I think about this, she's amazingly gifted and knowledgeable. I, I, I could be taught by her all day long. I don't have any idea most of the speaking in tongues she does when she's talking about aortic distensions and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, whatever. This is a new language. I have not heard of these things. I know the heart and it's shaped like this, right? And it's red and you give it, a, 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 you fill it with chocolate. And, and you go, well, sort of. Um, but she's new to her team, right? And they have male and female doctors and male and female nurses, but she observed an open heart surgery on a newborn recently, and she did all of the listening that day, 
and none of the talking, as I understand it. She didn't go in and go, oh, well, I just graduated, and blah, 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 blah. What, what she did, she was honored to be in the room. And when she came home, you couldn't shut her up. Why? Because she learned so much that day with her eyes and ears open and her mouth closed. Mm, what I could learn from that. And so when you think about this, this is what Paul's saying, I believe, in this context, and there's nothing too difficult to understand about that. Verse 36, did the word of God originally come from you? Well, <laughs> or did it come from God? Was it only you that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things I write to you are the commandments of the Lord, verse 37. But if you're ignorant, let him be ignorant. I love that. He's like, you know what? If you're going to be stupid, just be stupid. If you're going to ignore the obvious, just ignore the obvious. If you're going to go on with your dorky ideas, go on with your dorky ideas. Do it your way. Um, you know, one of my, the few things I really picked from Dr. Phil, if he, not this Dr. Phil, although I call him Dr. Phil because he's very therapeutic for me, but the one who's on TV, he has an amazing thing. He'll listen to somebody's approach to their life, and at the end of it, he asks, and how's that working for you? Uh, which is amazing because they're like, well, it isn't. It's landed us here. And you go, this is what Paul's saying. You know what? <laughs> if you if you got a brain, use it to hear what I'm saying. If you don't, you're not going to listen to what I'm saying anyway. So go ahead and be dumb if you want to be dumb. Verse 39, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. Don't forbid speaking in tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. See, this is the probably the single sentence summary for this passage for me anyway, and I'll shut up with this. The 1440 filter, I would call it, the 1440 filter, let all things be done decently and in order. Boy, just that, if that was a church motto, what an amazing motto it would be, because think of the two parts of it. Let all things be done. Let all things be done. See, a lot of people are like, well, then no, we forbid this. We forbid speaking in tongues. We forbid words of knowledge. We forbid somebody thinking that they have a, a word from the Lord to share with people in a prophetic sense. We forbid all these things and you go but but it says let all things be done there's the first half of it let all things be done all things all things you see in scripture well that's a pretty big all things i've seen some pretty crazy wild things in scripture so man i don't want to miss out on the supernatural i want to be open to those things let all things be done but there's some people who think that's the verse let all things be done and so all at once all the time anywhere and you go, well, that's not it either. The second half of the verse says decently and in order. Now, some places, again, have decently in order all down. We're decent. We're in order. We do not allow God to interrupt our carefully structured world with anything that doesn't make perfect sense to us. And you go, well, okay, that's decent. It's in order, but it's missing the let all things be done. And so when you think about that single filter, the 1440 filter, let all things be done decently in order, man, what a balanced life that is. What an amazing life that is to say the supernatural, bring it on, Lord. But may the attention go to God. See, I think that's the, the easiest filter I ever learned, which is where's the attention going? If God gets the glory, it's all good. If man gets the glory... It's not all good. That has a tremendous capacity to go off the rails. See, there are things that you can do in your private devotional life. I got nothing to say about it. Do what you do and enjoy your time with God. Do what you do. But I might have something to say if you did it here. Because you think about this. If you want to sing the praises of God in Swahili, if that's what you think it is, naked in the shower, go for it. I mean, seriously, praise him. He sees you naked anyway. He's not, that no big deal. And I think he knows Swahili. But if you do that in one of our services, well, we might draw a crowd. Um, there, you know, if we announced it in advance. But, but the problem is, that's not God. That's not glory going to God. That same thing in a different place is totally wrong. Yes, it's your right. But now it's become wrong. You made a mess of the message. You made a mess of the message. So pursue love, desire gifts, 
Let all things be done decently in order in your life. Let all things be done. Say, Lord, I'm open to all things. As long as they're decent and in order. Well, you'll stay out of tongue trouble and in a lot other types of trouble too. Again, I think about our society. That's what I say today. We're not very good at staying out of trouble with our tongues. We get into so much of it. Why? Because we have a right to free speech. I go, yeah, but how did my right become so wrong? That's what I chose to say with my freedom. Yikes. Am I free to do it? Yeah, but here's the glory. I'm free not to. I'm free not to say those stupid things. And I think about that and I go, but it takes more Holy Spirit sometimes to stay silent than to say something. 